the title of the talk, oh, I'm George, by the way. Hi, it's my first time here. Uh, the title of the talk, Functions for Nothing and test, Your Test for Free. It's a little bit opaque, so I'm going to have to explain this bad joke. The first part of the uh, title, <laughs> F-sharp, is going to give us functions for free, and the tests are going to be generated by F-sharp and property-based testing. Uh, does anyone here already do property-based testing? Yeah, one or two, F-sharp, some. Okay, good, no one knows anything about what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hopefully you do. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so you might be wondering what's going on in the background here. If you try and find royalty-free images on Google search for testing in software, it's very depressing. So instead, we have this, which is uh, a page from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This one was owned by Hunefa. That's his name, if you're going to take notes. He's this guy in the white here, and on the left. So this is like a comic book strip. He's coming along. And it turns was that out. Easier to Google? Hmm? Was that easier to Google? Yeah. <laughs> no, this is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is Hunefa's copy of the Book of the Dead, and it turns out it's actually a representation of a continuous integration pipeline from 3,300 <laughs> years ago. Um, Hunefa was a royal scribe. You might have heard some people like Uncle Bob describe programmers as the modern day scribes, because nothing gets done without us. Another con uh, title that Hunefa had was the overseer of royal cattle. So he had something to do with DevOps as well. But <laughs> this is the continuous integration pipeline. First of all, Hunefa comes in. He's got code he wants to deploy. Anubis brings him down here to the testing area. This is where the main stuff happens. They weigh his heart, which is the code, against this feather. If the feather is heavier, the code passes, it's all good. On the right here, <laughs> we have Thoth, who is recording the test results. Amit down the bottom, if the code fails, she's going to eat it and destroy it so it can never go to production. Um, <laughs> obvious. If it passes, Netflix comes over here with Horus, the uh, falcon-headed god, and Horus takes him to meet Osiris, and his code's going to live forever in the afterlife or the production environment. And he's got in his hand the ank, which is the keys for production. So this is very straightforward. <laughs> but the part that we're interested in is this testing area. So Anubis here, the world's first QA engineer, he is weighing the code against this feather. Now, the feather is the attribute of Ma'at. She is the god of righteous living and truth and all that kind of stuff. So Anubis has actually got a very easy job. He's got the literal embodiment of truth, and he can just weigh the code against it. But for us as software engineers, it's much harder. We don't have a literal copy of truth on our desk. We have to construct the truth for every project we work on, and it's always different. And the requirements, the standard of truth is always different. So some projects throw away. We don't have to write any tests at all. Others, on the other end of the spectrum, you need formal verification, stuff like that. Um, Property-based testing helps us get a very deep, uh, thorough testing while doing less work overall. So it's really high leverage, which is something I look for in all my tooling. Uh, CI itself, continuous integration, <coughs> is very high leverage. You might have to put in a bit of work at the start, uh, a few hours or days or even weeks, depending on how complex your project is, to get it all set up and running. But once it's going, there's very little in maintenance cost. Uh, code review, another one. There's social costs to set it up at the beginning. But once you're doing it, the whole standard of code gets raised. <coughs> so leverage, putting a little bit of effort and getting a big result out is something I look for in all my tools. And F Sharp is another example, which we'll talk about at the end. So. O overview? No, there shouldn't be a question mark here, but this is what we're going to look at. What are property-based tests? Uh, what specifically do Hedgehog and FS check, which are two libraries? What do they do for us? Uh, how do we apply property-based tests to our own code? What are the patterns that we can use? And what are the not-to-do patterns, or anti-patterns? And then we'll talk about F-sharp for testing, and we'll show how it all fits together and how F-sharp works really well with property-based tests. You don't have to be using F Sharp in your main project. You can test C Sharp, you can test your C++ code, or you can test web services remotely. So what are property-based tests, and what is the point of property-based testing? More importantly is ask, to ask, what problem is it trying to solve in the first place? So here's a very simple test. 
the things that we're testing here don't really matter that much. It's more the ideas. So at the top, we've got C sharp. The F sharp is at the bottom. It's just there for you to look at. Don't get too scared by it. It's, uh, you'll get more used to it as we go on. And then at the end, you might understand the demo a bit better. <laughs> so the unit testing framework I'm using here is F, uh, X unit, sorry, which is this fact attribute, which just says, this is a test that I want to run. OK, so it's very straightforward. Uh, someone's joined, we joined a new team, and they said, you need to test the uppercase method. Great. So our test is we're going to take in a hello lowercase string, uppercase it, and make sure it's uppercased. But we're only exercising one specific example here. So we might want to try a few more. So we could convert this into a oops, push space bar from now on. Convert this into a theory test that X unit has, where we can provide multiple uh, different inputs, which is the inline data thing here. And they will get passed to the function as parameters. So here we've converted the body of the function to just say, when we uppercase the input, it should be equal to the output. And then in the inline data section, we say, these are the values. And we might have, now we have to think up some more kind of values that we need to put in here to try and explore the different paths inside the function. So as inspiration, you might have seen this joke before about a Hugh Engineer walking into a bar, and he tries to break the bar because that's what they like doing. So he orders a beer, zero beers, 999 million beers, a lizard, etc. So we might take that as inspiration and put these as inputs into our test. So we've got beer, lizard, and Spidel Genese. But these are all the same thing, really, when you look at them, beer and lizard and the last one. Uh, they're not actually asserting that much different from what we had before. And the un there's an interesting case here, which is the zero one, which is actually not changing. But when we keep adding examples and stuff like this, when do we know that we're done testing the test? Is it just when we run out of steam, we run out of ideas? Or do we do branch coverage? Do we do line-based coverage? There's different things, but what property-based testing is all about is stepping back from this kind of example-based testing and saying, can we identify something about the function that's always true no matter what? <clears throat> so here we've converted the test to say, for any input, no matter what it is, we're going to convert it to uppercase using our toUpper function. And then we'll check there is no lowercase letters left in the output. So that makes sense for uppercase. And you'll note that this is not a specification of the function. It doesn't tell us everything about what upper, uppercase does. It's just one property of uppercase, which hence the name property-based testing. <clears throat> and then we should give this function a better name, because it doesn't test uppercase fully. It tests one property of uppercase. So we could say there's no lowercase in the two upper result. Now, we have a problem. Because we have this function which says it works for any input, but we don't actually have the inputs to put into this. So how do we run this test? And there's different strategies. And one that's taken by fscheck and all other quick check derived libraries is that we just put random values in here. We randomly generate, we literally flip a coin, and we put them in here. And what we're trying to get here is kind of like an 80% kind of thing. We're getting most of the way there. We're not doing formal verification. Um, there are other libraries that will do that. So Microsoft has one, it used to be called PIX, but it's now part of Visual Studio Enterprise, which will actually look at the implementation of your function on the test and try and generate different inputs that will break it by taking different parts. So that does white box testing. Uh, in Haskell land, there's one called small check, which is for if your inputs are from a small domain, like it's a byte or it's an enum, or something where you can enumerate all the values and test them all. Uh, then you should just do that, and that's called exhaustive testing. That's what small check does. But <clears throat> today we're going to be looking at quick check in the derived libraries, FS check. Uh, there's another more recent one called Hedgehog, but we're not going to look at it to not confuse anyone. <laughs> so, what do Hedgehog and FS check do? As I said, they're libraries for randomized execution of property based tests. So we kind of separate the idea of property based testing from how we run them. Uh, oh, just to mention, QuickCheck's been around since 1999, so it's like 20 years ago. Um, and if you don't write C Sharp or anything .NET based as your main language, you can find an implementation. There's one for Python. There's even uh, there's a C version, C++. 
So what do they provide? It's a way to generate the input random test data for our tests and shrink it, which is very important. And they also provide integration with the test runner. So if we take our previous example, the way to convert it to run it with FS check <coughs> would be to mark it as a property up the top with property attribute instead of fact. And we actually have to mark this string as non-null as well, using the special type that they provide. Otherwise, it would generate null strings as inputs as well as valid strings. And that's all you need to do to get it to run your test. So it can do that because it knows how to generate strings. It knows how to generate basically any primitive type, ints, bools, uh, any enum, because it can just select an enum value. Um, if you've got any simple types that only take in other simple types, it will know how to generate them. So if your type has a constructor and it takes two strings and it has strings as properties, it knows that it can put strings in and make your type and so on recursively. So let's say you had a person and a person has an address and address is made up of strings. Since it can make strings, it can make addresses and since it can make addresses, it can make people. And so that works really well. Sometimes you need to customize this though. So you can write your own generators so don't worry too much about the, what's going on here because uh, Jeremy will be covering some of it, I'm assuming, <laughs> in the workshop. But if we wanted to write a generator for a type called dog, which has a name, uh, a bunch of colors that the dog is colored, and a favorite food, we could say we want the name to be any arbitrary string. We don't really care. So there's a bunch of these called like, combinators, like array of. We want the colors to be an array of any color. And then we can also say, define our own generators out of other generators and make bigger ones. So our food generator is going to return either fish, carrot, or shoes. And then we say, we make a dog out of these. So you'll notice that it's using the link syntax, which is quite unusual for C-sharp libraries. But it's because of monads, and cetera. But you don't really need to worry about that. <laughs> it, so <laughs> you can pretend they're ienumerables, basically. So give me any string, give me an array of colors, give me a food, and I'll give you a new dog. Uh, and the F-sharp version is quite similar, except that we have this gen, uh, what is called a computation expression. And that lets us write the code as if there is nothing strange going on. So we just assign a name, assign colors, assign food, and then we return our own dog. So that's just to get the flavor of how you write your own generators. We're not going to talk about too much about that, because we're doing that in the workshop. So. You might think this is a lot of effort to generate random values and you'd rather just think up values and try and break your code on your own. Uh, yes, <laughs> but you only have to write this dog generator once. And once you've got it, you can use it all over your code, all over your test code. And I'm pretty sure that you will find things that you don't expect because the random generator is very good at generating random values. Much better than your brain. Firstly, you've got well, I've got two stories here. The first one is the unexpected baseball. Uh, deep in our system, we have metadata from users that comes in. So this is all user provided, and it's stringy, stringy, dictionary. There's keys and there's values. Some of the keys have flashes on the front, and we want to deal with them specially. So we split them into two lists, and then we go off and we process these independent of these ones. So this part of our system had been there a long time, and it looked fine. And then we started to apply property-based testing to it. And it started to generate tests, and then we had one that failed. And we looked at the failing values, and it had this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the random data is fine. That looks all good. But you will get just anything from across Unicode. We did end up with a random Egyptian character in there, and I did not um, <laughs> plan that. <laughs> but in this section, we ended up with one with a baseball on the front. And we're looking at it, and that looks very strange for a section of code that, uh, data that's meant to only start with flashes. So we go back to the code, and it says this. If the key starts with slash, then put it into the slashes group. Otherwise, it's going to go along with all the other data. And that looks fine, right? Well, the thing is, if you say this in .NET any language, this is not going to do what you think it does. Well, <laughs> it's a different definition of starts with. By default, you're going to get a language specific or language sensitive comparison. And what that means for starts with is really, does this value 
if I were to sort these two values together, would they sort at the same place in a list? Which is not really what people think of when they say start Swift. So what do you think .NET says for this? Does this string start with slash? .NET says yes, there's a slash here, <laughs> because none of these characters affect sorting order. Baseball was one of them, but so is scissors. I hope there's no words in here, but um, none of these characters. There's something like 2,400 characters that don't affect sorting order, and I couldn't put them all on this slide. But the correct implementation, once you know what the problem is, is very easy. We were actually wanting an ordinal comparison, not a language-sensitive comparison. And what this does is just literally does this actually start with the slash. So that's something that's kind of <coughs> what this randomized testing is really good at finding things that's so far out of where your headspace is that you don't even expect them to be there. Um, so for all machine readable data, that's probably what you want. Another one that we found was to do with regular expressions. You'll notice that both of these are to do with strings because strings are very, well, they're a huge value space and there's all this kind of hidden complexity there. In a very old piece of our code, we had this kind of regular expression for validating identifier-like um, names. And that looks fine if you can read regular expressions, but well, I'm going to explain it anyway. The intent of the developer is that this should match the caret matches the start of the string. Then we have alphanumeric characters A to Z and 0 to 9, 3 to 4 times, and then the end of the string. So the developer wanted to match strings that only had three to four alphanumeric characters. Any, any hands? No, that's not the problem. End of string? This dollar sign means end of string, possibly preceded by a new line. It doesn't actually mean end of string. So you can imagine what would happen if someone puts an account name into your system that ends in a new line things will go pop. <laughs> and the tests found this kind of stuff. So the correct end of a string is this backslash z, which is very intuitive. <laughs> um, so we learned these lessons about being able to write the tests requires the imagination to actually come up with something in the first place. Um, often when you're writing code, you have these assumptions, not just about what's valid in your code, but also what the invalid data looks like. Uh, and property-based testing can kind of say, hey, what about this? And throws you something from far out left field. Um, I mean, on my keyboard, I can't even type the baseball character to write the test, so. Actually, I can now with Windows 10, but <laughs> there's an emoji keyboard. Uh, even if there's one thing you take away from this, go check your users of starts with and uh, the regular expression dollar sign. So property-based testing helps reveal these unknown unknowns that we don't know about. So now you all want to use it because you want to break your code. So how do we apply property-based testing to our own code bases? So sometimes people run off and they're like, I'm going to do it, and then they come back and they say, I don't know what to test for. There's a bunch of patterns for this. Um, the easiest, obvious one is to take your existing parameterized tests and upgrade them to use property-based testing. So we just basically re replace all the canned examples just with a fully qualified, you can put in any value here. Or just keep the existing ones and extract that uh, test and try and turn it into a property-based test by thinking about what is it actually trying to solve. And then there's a whole bunch of kind of mathematical, uh, really general properties about functions that can be applied when you don't even know what the input and output values are. So item potence is one of them. They all have funny names because mathematicians sat there coming up with them. But the idea of idempotence is once is enough. If you apply a function once or you apply it twice, it's going to give you the same result. So things like that give you this effect the uh, uppercase. And again, once you uppercase the string, if you uppercase it again, it doesn't change. It will stay the same value. The absolute function, once you convert it to a positive number, it's going to stay positive. And a lot of these things, when you see Haskell people talking about them, you're like, well, I can't actually apply them to my code. My code has state and mutation and web services and all this good stuff. But for a lot of them, there's an equivalent kind of stateful definition where we actually say, well, if f is a class, 
So x is some object that we have, and f is our function on it. We can actually say, well, if we call it once or call it twice, we should have the same state at the end of this. Uh, so an example for this would be create or delete. If we have a service and we can create or delete accounts, for example, if we create an account and we try and create that same account again, it should be the same as creating it once. Even if the second one gives us an error back, the state of the system should be the same after both. You don't want to have, end up with two duplicate, duplicate accounts. <coughs> uh, delete is another one. So if you delete an account and then you delete an account, the same account again, it should have the same effect as deleting it once. And then this is something that will come up in model-based testing. Uh, round tripping. This is really useful for anyone who's got JSON in their services, which is probably everyone. Uh, so the idea is we have two functions, from and to. So to will convert our object to some other representation, and from will convert it back. And we check, basically, that we can do both and get back what we expected, which is the same value. So serialization, really common, JSON, XML, any, any of that kind of stuff. You want to check that you can convert it to the serialized representation, convert it back, and you have the same data. Like None of the properties have gone missing. You haven't got any random defaults popping in. And that will give you, actually, a surprising amount of coverage. Uh, in terms of state for services, if we store a value and get it back, we should get back the same kind of value. So if you, well, there's lots of scenarios where this applies, but basically put and get in HTTP should be able to uh, store and get and get back the same thing. <coughs> uh, there's a kind of involution or self-inverse of round tripping, which is the same function will undo itself. Uh, so reverse of a list, if you reverse a list and reverse it again, you get back the same one. Negate of a number, which isn't as common, but it's something to be aware of if you can apply that. And I don't know of anything, any way to apply that to stateful things, but someone might. Okay, another thing you can do is check invariance of your functions. Uh, invariant is something we can ask about the input and the output, and we want to make sure it's the same. So for reverse, of a list, if you reverse a list, the length doesn't change. So in that case, length is the invariant. Uh, select or map has the same one. If you select over a list or map over a list, you'll get the same number of elements out, even if the elements change. Uh, in terms of stateful services, this isn't something you can really easily do, because you don't want to assert, basically, once I change an account, nothing else changes. Uh, in that case, it's much better to do model-based testing. Uh, which we'll, again, look at later. So some more uh, commutativity. If order doesn't matter, make sure you test that. So this might not have been something you've identified in the past, but you can look at a function and say, actually, order doesn't matter, so I should write a property to say that order doesn't matter. Um, or you might have a series of actions where order doesn't matter. And so you can perform them in both orders and check that that happens true. Uh, I've used this myself. We've got internal services where we have an events coming from multiple different systems, and the order of the events coming into the service shouldn't change the result after all the events are coming. So we can check this by generating a stream of events. We randomize that, and that's the input to our function. So we have both the original stream and a shuffled stream. So we apply both those streams to two copies of the service and make sure that they agree at the end. Uh, there's also associativity which is rarer, but some people are doing uh, MapReduce style workloads where you want to make sure that if you have some operation <coughs> represented here by pizza, applied to three values or more values, if you just scan along the list of values applying it, x pizza y and then pizza z and then pizza w, if you're doing distributed reduce, you want to be able to break this up so you can put, say, z pizza w on one computer and x pizza y on another computer if they're an expensive operation, and then combine them later. So that's only uh, allowable if your function satisfies this rearrangement. <coughs> so that's another thing you can test for if you're doing this kind of thing. OK, oracles. In the olden days, ancient times, oracles were someone you could go for to ask about the future. In terms of testing, they're a trusted implementation of your function that you can ask to confirm what you're trying to calculate. 
So here we just have the trusted function and our implementation. And you might be saying, why would we do that if we already have this trusted function? Because why don't we just use that as our actual implementation? Well, we can use them to re uh, verify re-implementations. If we've got some old crappy code that we're rewriting into new shiny code, we can take the old crappy code, put it in the test suite, and say that's our oracle. And the new code has to exactly match every result that that produces. Or optimize implementations. If we know there's a really stupid but easy way to calculate something and a fast but difficult way, write the easy, dumb way into the test suite and then write your fast, good way into the production code and check that they always match. Um, so the packet team, I don't know if anyone uses packet, it's kind of like a dependency manager for NuGet packages and so on. It has a dependency solver in it and they've got a really good blog post about how they used a brute force dependency solver to confirm that their advanced fast one was working, and it wasn't working, but the, <laughs> the blog post is good. It tells you about how they did that. <coughs> and finally, model-based testing. Um, it's kind of like Oracle-based testing, but we don't do, we don't try and implement the full system into our test suite. We pick one aspect, and we only implement the bits that we need to check that, and then we we need some way to describe actions as values, and we randomly generate actions, apply it to all the implementations, and check that all the models match what our service is doing. Um, and that's what we'll be, I'll be demoing at the end, how that works. Anti-patterns. Things you should not do when you're doing property-based testing. Rerunning failures. So this is kind of a bad thing to do even with normal unit tests, but with property-based tests, it's especially bad because Every time you run them, you're going to get a different set of inputs. Uh, and so if you run it and it fails and you run it again, you're going to get different inputs and you've thrown away the actual case that was important to you. In the first check, you can create a, you can get a C from the C yes. and you can rerun the test from C. Yep. So, yes, in the first check, you can grab the seed and Hmm? Repeat the question. Yes. You're saying, in FS check, you can grab the seed. So when you have a test failure, the seed will appear in the output. And the seed is what was used to generate the random values for your test. So you can then plug that value into your code and rerun it. So if it failed on your CI server and you need to replicate that locally to step through debugging, you can copy the seed into your local code and redo it. But every time you get a specific failure with uh, property-based tests, you should investigate that. And then consider, once you've figured out what the bug was, consider putting that failure as an example-based test so that you don't get a regression later on. Maybe, like, maybe the tests are running really well for ages and then they randomly fail and you're like, ooh, it actually found a really interesting case. Okay, this one could seem kind of obvious. But don't rewrite your real code in your test suite. And this is, sounds stupid, but it's a really easy trap to walk into without realizing it. Um, especially when you're doing validation or trying to test the validation method. So imagine we have a password uh, strength restriction that has to be at least eight characters long, less than 500, has to have a symbol, has to have a number. If you start writing a property to try and encode this, you might go, oh, if it is at least five characters long and less than 500 and has a symbol and has a number, then, well, you've just rewritten your actual code into the test. Uh, and something you can do instead here is to test the negative cases. So normally your validation is kind of like a, a series of ands that have to pass. So if, if you invert them all and write them as separate tests, you can avoid this problem. So instead of saying if the string is at least five characters and less than 500, et cetera, you say, hold on, if the string is less than five characters, it has to be invalid. And that's one test. If the string is longer than 500 characters, it has to be invalid. If the string has no symbols, it has to be invalid. If the string has no numbers, it has to be invalid. So you're kind of doing the opposite. Instead of trying to draw a line around the exact valid values that you are allowed, instead just cut off big chunks of what's not allowed. OK. Uh, something else that should, which is not obvious when you first start is that don't filter input values yourself. So if you have a function that only works when the input values are of a certain configuration, don't do that filtering in your test. Uh, so let's say you have a function that only works when the input is a multiple of pi or something like that. So in your 
test suite, you go, if the inputs are multiple of pi, then I can run the assertions. That's great, but you're not actually ever going to hit the assertions because it's never going to generate exactly a multiple of pi. Um, so what you should do instead of this is the frameworks, uh, FS check has got this implies operator that you can use, and you say it makes the test conditional on the input. So you can say if the input is a multiple of pi, then I'm going to run this. But the difference is that FS check understands this, and so it will know if you're not actually <coughs> passing the conditional enough. Uh, so if it can't generate enough values to actually run the test, you'll get a test failure instead of silently passing. Uh, and if you do need to generate, if it is failing like that and you need to generate specific values, then think of other ways to generate them. So maybe you generate, if you need multiples of pi, you gener directly generate multiples of pi by generating integers and then multiplying them by pi, as an example. Okay. <coughs> and now we're going on to why is F sharp nice for testing? So changing gears a bit. I'm not going to go like F sharp tutorial 101. I'm just going to pick like some of the best features that I found that make testing really nice with F sharp. <coughs> so first of all, free functions. The compiler gives you free stuff, and it's really nice, and you have to write less code. This is what it feels like when the compiler helps you. <laughs> so here's a type definition in F sharp. Uh, this is what's called a record type. It has two fields, and the fields have types, and they're written after the field names. And that's it. So what does this actually give us for free? Well, if we look at the C sharp comparable code, the basic structure looks something like this. We have rank and suit, and we have some properties of rank and suit, and that's all fairly straightforward. But the F sharp compiler will also generate us equals. So we know it knows how to compare things for us. Uh, it will implement equals and the object equals, and it will implement get hash code, which I never write. I always ask ReSharper to write this for me because I don't want to mess around with fiddly numbers. And if I ever modify the properties, I just delete this and ask ReSharper to build me a new one. But in F sharp, the compiler gives it to me, so I don't need to worry about that. Uh, it also gives us comparable by default. So I, don't, I don't, hope no one formats their code in two columns like this, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it implements compare to, and the default is it will compare things in the order you listed them in the type. So for the example here, it's going to compare rank first and then suit. And that's not always what you want, but especially for test code, I often don't really care what the ordering is as long as I can have one, because I want to use it to sort and display values really nicely. So default is almost always good enough for test code. It also gives us two string, which will dump out the properties that we have in our type. And that's really useful for test codes. So every time we have a test failure, we'll get the actual values and not just whatever C sharp is, which I think is just the class name. It's very unhelpful. And once you've got orderable and equatable, you probably also want all the operators. So the F sharp gives us that too. Now we're up to something like 70 lines of code, and that's even with using the shortened function syntax instead of this. So this in a test suite is very good. I can compare them, I can sort them, I can print them out. Everything you want. Next is discriminated unions. So the discriminated unions, also called sum types, or in Scala, case classes, and they're all about choices. So here we have a choice from this amazing American vending machine of raspberry lime orange lemon, vanilla, cherry, original Coke, and cherry vanilla. But we can't choose anything else. And that's what a discriminated union gives us. For example, if we were to make a suit type for our previous playing card type, we could say it's spades, clubs, huts, or diamonds. And those are the only values that you can have. So it's kind of like an enum in C Sharp, but you can't, well, it's a bit safer. You can't cast integers in and out of this type and put funny values in there. It's only ever going to be these. Uh, another thing we can do with that is you can actually put data into each case. So if we wanted to make a general result type that could re represent success or failure, we could do this. We have a case for failure, which is going to contain a string, which is some message describing what the failure is. 
the generic types are the same as in C-sharp, except you always have to put a, a positive key on the front. And we can also have a success case, which is actually going to have a value in it. So it could either be failure with a string or success with a real value. And if you uh, need a bit of a mental model of this, it could look something like this in C-sharp. It's not actually what the compiler generates. But you can imagine a base result type which has subclasses of success with a key value and failure with a string value. Which brings us to pattern matching. So pattern matching is kind of a, if the discriminated unions let us build types up out of different things, pattern matching lets us break them down and match against them, tearing things down instead of building them up. So if we still have our result type there, we could have a get person method which takes the name and the result type is on the end here, which is going to be result of person. If we wanted to call that in pattern match and against the result, we could say get person George, and then we match this value with these cases. And the first one that matches will be what the result is. So in the failure case, we're going to get that string message. In the success case, we're going to get P, which is person. And so we can deconstruct it like that. So C sharp is now getting this a little bit. It's starting to come in. But it's not quite as powerful as F sharp yet. For example, in F sharp, we can also pattern match specifically on the values inside the data, uh, inside the choices. So if I say get person George and I get back a failure, which says George is not available because he's currently presenting, I can handle that case specifically. Otherwise, it will go through to the next failure case or success, depending on what it is. So C sharp keeps stealing all the good ideas, but it hasn't yet taken this one. And the final thing that makes F sharp really nice for tests is naming. It lets me just write whatever I want. Okay. This is just a random example I grabbed off Stack Overflow. I'm sure you've seen names like this before. Account balance increases when deposit is made. It's kind of breathless. You can put underscores in it to try and make it better. <laughs> this is um, Nick Craver. He's the architecture lead for Stack Overflow. He posted this a few days ago. And so don't feel bad about your test cases because there's something like three or four different naming conventions in here. Um, that's really because C Sharp doesn't let you do what you want to do, which is just write a name. So in F Sharp, we can put double backticks. And within there, we can put anything we want. So we can write a sentence with spaces. Account balance increases when deposit is made. We can put punctuation. We can put anything we want in here. Uh, if we really love a test, we can put emoji in. If we hate a test, we can use the stinky emoji. Cool. So those are my four top things for why F Sharp makes testing really nice. And I'll do a little bit of a demo, well, more of a display. I'm not going to live code it, but I'll show how we can use, oh, it's behind me now, how we can use F Sharp and property-based testing together. OK. Is that big enough for people in the back? OK. So imagine we've got this service called the dog service. And just like earlier, we can create a dog which has a name, a color. I got lazy and I used console color here. But we can also have a favorite food. And the other operations are delete dog and list all our favorite dogs that are in the service. So uh, and now this is all C sharp code for our implementation. Uh, our file dog service is going to store dogs as files in the file system. And for some reason, the person who wrote this decided it would be good if we called out to command.exe to implement it. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like they were trying to get bugs. But the create dog takes the name, color, and favorite food. It finds the file path where it should store the data. And then it runs echo to put all this data into that file. Delete dog does the same thing. It finds a file for that particular dog. Then it runs the del command to delete that dog. I'll move that up, actually, so you can see it. And finally, the delete dog, uh, the list dogs method uses the proper get files method uh, to find all the files that are in this directory where we're storing, storing the dogs. Now, the file for name method is an attempt to make it secure by excluding 
anything with an absolute path, dots, quotes, slashes, or if it's empty or a white space string. Uh, if it's any of those, it's going to abort. Otherwise, it's, it'll return the path where it wants the dog to be stored. And lastly, we just have the little helper method which will run the command for us in command.exe. Now, if we go over to our program, I remember earlier in the model-based testing thing I said we need, first of all, a way to re represent actions as values. So that's what this action type is here. So we're using the discriminated unions to make an action type which has three alternatives. The first one is create dog, uh, which has a string for name, a color, and a string for food. And we've put non null on these just so if, it, if it's checked on generate that's null values, which we don't want. Delete dog similarly has a string and list accounts has no arguments because it doesn't. Con you don't need any arguments to invoke the method. Now, because fscheck knows how to n generate strings and enums, console colors and enum, it knows how to generate actions. It'll randomly put, randomly choose one of these three, and then randomly fill it with values. Okay. Next, we need a way to apply these actions. So. Here we're using pattern matching. We take in any dog <coughs> service and the action that we want to apply, and we just match on the action. If it's create dog, we call create dog. If it's delete dog, we call delete dog. If it's called list accounts, we whoop, forgot to rename that one. <laughs> uh, it calls list dogs. Um, in F sharp, if you want to ignore a value, you have to explicitly ignore it, otherwise, you'll get a compiler warning. And wrapped around this whole thing, We've got a big exception handler that just ignores the exceptions because we don't really care if the service rejects us. We want to just keep trying more actions against the service. And then we can use that to build a method called apply actions, which takes a list of actions and applies all of them. So list iter iterates over the list. And we've got a partially applied function here. So this will take in all the actions as a third argument and just keep applying them to the service. Secondly, we need a model of what are we, what are we actually going to measure in the service. Uh, this is our fake dog service, which has got a set of doggos. And it only stores the names of the dogs. We don't care about what's the data inside them. So the only thing we're going to verify here is, does the real service have the same dogs that we expect as in the fake service? Uh, so we have to have a validate just like the real one to try and exclude the same, uh, same Names that the real one excludes. <coughs> and then the implementation of the interface down here, we have the same three methods, create dog, delete dog, and list dogs. And create dog, we add it to the hash set. Delete dog, we remove it from the hash set. List dogs, we just get the result of the to list method. So we have the way to create actions. We have our fake model. Now we can write our property. And we just want to verify that the implementation of our real service matches what the model says. So again, we've got this list of actions. And fscheck is going to generate this and provide it to us for this method. Uh, temp there is just a help I wrote to delete all the dogs after, <laughs> after I finish with them. But the, we've got the file dog service, which is the real one, and the fake dog service, which is our model. So then we apply all the actions in the list to the real service, apply them all to the model, and now we expect both of these things to be in the same state because we've applied the both actions, same actions to both of them. So we get the expected dogs from the model service, the actual dogs from the real service, and then we check the result. And you can imagine we could have any number of models in here. We could write other ones. We could write a <laughs> class that helps abstract away all the details of running it on each other. So if we then, somewhere, run the test. Where is it? Here we go. Text Explorer. It's running. Has anyone else noticed their laptop gets slower over the last few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we've got a failure. So for some reason, the model and the implementation are disagreeing. Now, you can have failures. Your model can be incorrect. So, <laughs> but in this case, I'll zoom in on this. The 
This is what FS Check is telling us. It was able to run 48 successful tests and then one failed. Uh, shrinking is something I actually forgot to mention earlier. Once it generates your big heinous example that breaks your code, it'll try and shrink it down to a minimal test case by shrinking it one step at a time and rerunning the test until the test passes and then it will know, well, that last one I tried was the, the worst one, the minimal test case, sorry. <coughs> so here we've got the input to the test, the original input. This is what it tried to do. It generated us a big list with all these actions in it and you can see this is F sharp's two string working really well. It called list counts, 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 et cetera. Then it created a dog called Rahe, who's dark gray and then it called some more list counts, then it created a dog with a control character as a name. It did some more stuff and then it deleted the dog. But down here, whoops, this one where it says shrunk, this is what it managed to shrink the test case down to, which is create a dog whose name is A, dark gray and non-null. This is not actually the failure I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got something to do with quotes here. Hold on. Let me try and get the failure I wanted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking the first rule, I said. Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the fastest test because it is writing a lot of files from my file system and deleting them. <coughs> so if you are running this kind of thing against one of your real services, you want to kind of have an in-memory backing store for it so that it will run really quickly. How many times did you wipe out your file system when you got the test? Kind of I didn't. <laughs> Yet. Maybe it's doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a USB stick. <clears throat> yes, this is a failure I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the one I got in every test I ran before now. Um, so, the shrunk down minimal test case that it has generated for us is that we create a dog called A, who is magenta, has an empty favorite food, but then it deletes a dog called star. And in our model, we should still have a dog called A, but in our real implementation, there's no dogs left. So if we go look at the code, it's kind of obvious why. Because to delete a dog, it calls del, and star is a wildcard here in the, in the command.exe, so it's just gonna wipe out any files that are in there. So that's something we need to plug in our really secure <laughs> method. Uh, the other one is if you put a question mark in, that's also a wildcard. <laughs> so I think that shows how it's really nice to write a model-based test in F# -sharp because you can describe the actions and generate them very easily. And that's the final thing. If you want to do further reading, the original quick check paper, paper is, despite being about Haskell, fairly readable. Um, it's got a big discussion section at the end which talks about randomized testing and so on, which is really nice. Um, the packet, uh, one about the Oracle for the brute force version, version versus the real version is really good. And if you want to learn more about F Sharp, there's a website called F Sharp for Fun and Profit. And they've got two good ones on there. There's a series on property based testing and also domain modeling made functional, which talks about using F Sharp to describe your domain types. Now hopefully you're all going to go home in a few months' time. You'll be walking around doing this about property-based testing. Okay. Everyone should learn it. <laughs> cool, that's it. Is there any questions? What's the confidence level? I write a bunch of tests wrong and they will pass. Obviously it's random. Yes, so you need to kind of also, one thing I... What's the confidence level? Yeah, it depends on how complicated the kind of input domain to the function is. If you've got, say, a function that only fails when the, it takes in a double and it only fails when the double is equal to some specific value, it's never gonna find that. And that's what you need the hex thing for. But 
like I said, it's like an 80% kind of thing. Like it gets you almost all the way there, and then you can think really hard to try and pick out the last few cases to try and break the function. Um, I so another thing you need to do is when you have written your own generators, you should kind of um, sanity check them and just print out a few of the results. So there's a function that will just generate you like 100. So you can look at them and say, mm, are those, is that good enough? Like, you might accidentally be generating 99 empty lists and your function's not really testing anything. So. Yes? Um, you said when it finds like an interesting case, like, mm -hmm. like the baseball or the star there, yeah. that you, it might be good to convert that to, I think you said, an example-based test. Yeah. Is, is that something within the F? No, so I mean literally just make a new test and put that like back in as an assertion, yeah. just as a regular unit test. Yeah, right. Just because if you if you've been running the test for a long time and you haven't found any failures, and then you do find one, it's probably something fairly specific that you're not likely to run across again. So you need to fix it and encode that as a regression test. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. So you're going to end up with a set of FS spec tests and yep. a set in, in a real system and a set of normal uh, max unit and unit, yep. whatever. Yeah. Have you tried Hedgehog? Hedgehog, yes. I have a little bit. So Hedgehog, for those who don't know, is another uh, property testing library like FSCheck. Uh, it's newer and it takes a different approach to generation. So in FSCheck, generation is always driven by the types. So the types on the function tell you what it's going to be generated and put in. But for Hedgehog, you can explicitly ask, I want a string and it's going to be like this long. Uh, whereas with uh, if it's check to do that, you'd have to make a new type called my string, which specifically is that length. But, so Hedgehog is a bit nicer for when you need to do um, kind of negative testing, like if you specifically want really big strings or really small strings. Um, it's a bit more explicit, but it's also much newer. Like the C sharp support was only added two months ago by me, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's not quite as polished yet. It's a little bit slower. But I do like the approach of explicitly. Cool. If there's no more questions, I'll hand over to Pizza.